So thank you for joining today for this latest session of Continuing the Journey. We're going to look at Joshua chapter 7 today, but before I read the passage, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for the richness of your word, and I ask that you will speak to us through it today. If any of my words are not from you, may they drift away with the day and do no harm. But if you have something to say to us, may we hear it clearly and have the courage to act upon it. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, Joshua chapter 7, it's a long passage. But let me read it to you before we turn to consider some of the thoughts from, from it. But the Israelites acted unfaithfully in regard to the devoted things. Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zimri, the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah, took some of them, so the Lord's anger burned against Israel. Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near Beth-Avon, to the east of Bethel, and told them, go up and spy out the region. So the men went up and spied out Ai. When they returned to Joshua, they said, not all the people will have to go up against Ai. Send two or three thousand men to take it, and do not weary all the people, for only a few men are there. So about 3,000 men went up, but they were routed by the men of Ai, who killed about 36 of them. They chased the Israelites from the city gate as far as the stone quarries and struck them down on the slopes. At this, the hearts of the people melted and became like water. Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell face down to the ground before the ark of the Lord, remaining there till evening. The elders of Israel did the same and sprinkled dust on their heads. And Joshua said, Oh, sovereign Lord, why did you ever bring this people across the Jordan to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? If only we had been content to stay on the other side of the Jordan. O oh Lord, what can I say now that Israel has been routed by its enemies? The Canaanites and the other people of the country will hear about this and they will surround us and wipe out our name from the earth. What then will you do for your own great name? The Lord said to Joshua, stand up. What are you doing down on your face? Israel has sinned. They have violated my covenant, which I commanded them to keep. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen. They have lied. They have put them with their own possessions. That is why the Israelites cannot stand against their enemies. They turn their backs and run because they have been made liable to destruction. I will not be with you any more unless you destroy whatever among you is devoted to destruction. Go, consecrate the people. Tell them, consecrate yourselves in preparation for tomorrow. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. That which is devoted among you, O Israel, you cannot stand against your enemies until you remove it. In the morning, present yourselves tribe by tribe. The tribe that the Lord takes shall come forward clan by clan. The clan that the Lord takes shall come forward family by family. And the family that the Lord takes shall come forward man by man. He who is caught with the devoted things shall be destroyed by fire, along with all that belongs to him. He has violated the covenant of the Lord and has done a disgraceful thing in Israel. Early the next morning, Joshua had Israel come forward by tribes and Judah was taken. 
the clans of Judah came forward and he took the Zerahites. He had the clan of the Zerahites come forward by families and Zimri was taken. Joshua had his family come forward man by man and Achan, son of Carmi, the son of Zimri, the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah was taken. Then Joshua said to Achan, my son, give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel and give him the praise. Tell me what you have done. Do not hide it from me. Achan replied, it is true. I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. This is what I have done. When I saw in the plunder a beautiful robe from Babylonia, 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them and took them. They are hidden in the ground inside my tent with the silver underneath. So Joshua sent messengers and they ran to the tent and there it was, hidden in his tent with the silver underneath. They took the things from the tent, brought them to Joshua and all the Israelites and spread them out before the Lord. Then Joshua, together with all Israel, took Achan, son of Zerah, the silver, the robe, the gold wedge, his sons and daughters, his cattle, donkeys and sheep, his tent and all that he had to the valley of Echor. Joshua said, why have you brought this trouble on us? The Lord will bring trouble on you today. Then all Israel stoned him and after they had stoned the rest, they burned them. Over Achan they heaped up a large pile of rocks which remains to this day. Then the Lord turned from his fierce anger. Therefore that place has been called the Valley of Echor ever since. Well we're deep into the book of Joshua now and it can't have escaped anybody's notice that we're also now deep into the Euros football competition. And it's hard to avoid falling into a series of football analogies. But I think there is one analogy which is valid to our story today, and that's the old adage that a team is at its most vulnerable just after scoring. There's a risk of a bit of self-satisfaction perhaps some overconfidence and players can forget the game plan. And as they're off their guard, they're most vulnerable to the opposition scoring a goal in response to their earlier success. Well, the Israelites have just won an amazing victory over Jericho. We looked at that last week in chapter six. It was an unexpected victory against the odds, yet it was well planned, it was guided by God, and the Israelites were obedient to God in carrying out the plan. Now, apparently, they had an easier challenge of taking the town of Ai. And as with Jericho, they send spies to check out the opposition. But there's little evidence this time of a prayerful preparation or even a clear message from God of how they're to go about their business. They seem to be relying more on their own judgment, assuming victory. Perhaps there's even an element of arrogance here, certainly self-reliance. Send two or three thousand, that'll be enough. And the result of this overconfidence is a rout. 36 men lose their lives, but more than that, it results in a humiliating defeat for Israel, which puts their future at risk. And we read that the hearts of the people melted. They recognized their failure, uh, something's gone wrong, but what's their response? 
Well, in the first instance, in verses 7 to 9, we see something, an element perhaps of self-pity. Joshua starts to ask, why, why did God bring them to where they are? Why didn't they stay the other side of the Jordan? And there's also uh, an aspect of turning the problem back to God and asking what he's going to do about it. They say in, um, in verse 9, what then will you do for your own great name? So the Israelites seem to be looking outwards for why things have gone wrong rather than inwards and questioning their own actions. We then get a stark contrast as God speaks and it's, it's a complete contrast with these earlier excuses and self-pity. It's a very striking, direct message, direct to the underlying moral cause of the defeat. This is where the real problem is to be found, says God, and there's no holding back. He really gives it to them, both barrels. Uh, verse 11, we read that they've sinned, they've violated the covenant, they've ignored God's command, they've stolen and they've lied. This is a really direct and must have been a painful rebuke from God. And there's a consequence of that sin and that consequence is a separation between God and the Israelites. That relationship is broken down. And we read in verse 12 that made them liable to destruction. They've opened themselves up to failure through their sin. And God instructs them to sort out the problem, to put things right. What, what exactly is the problem? Well, the, the Israelites acted unfaithfully in regard to the devoted things. Let me just remind you of verse 1 of this chapter. It says, but the Israelites acted unfaithfully in regard to the devoted things. Achan um, took some of them, so the Lord's anger burned against Israel. These devoted things were assigned to God. They were articles dedicated to God. And there'd been very clear instructions about how the Israelites should handle those devoted things. We have to take a glance back into chapter 6, verses 18 and 19, to understand fully the significance of this. Let me just read you those verses but keep away from the devoted things so that you will not bring about your own destruction by taking any of them. Otherwise, you will make the camp of Israel liable to destruction and bring trouble on it. All the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and iron are sacred to the Lord and must go into his treasury. So there's a very clear command and guidance here that this man, Achan, has, uh, has contradicted. Israel had hung on to what was devoted or belonged to God, and this had to be corrected, or this separation from God would continue. So we see this recognition of failure. We see the Israelites being faced with the truth of their sin, and we understand something of the consequences of that sin, the separation from God. And then the passage moves on to describe the confession of guilt as this focus falls on this man, Achan, for his actions. And this narrowing down and the pointing of the finger, you can almost feel the beads of sweat forming on his brow as he realises that he is the focus of this attention and the problem. And Achan confesses his sin in verse 20. And what is it that he's taken? Well, it's about two kilograms of silver, about half a kilogram of gold, and a beautiful robe that obviously caught his eye. He'd coveted these things, he'd stolen them, 
he buried them and hidden them. And I think this leads us really to the, for me, the most poignant verse of the whole passage, which is verse 23, when Achan is faced with what he's done. And it says, they took the things from the tent, from his tent, and they brought them to Joshua and all the Israelites and spread them out before the Lord. And I imagine what a pitiful sight that must have been. This man who's lost everything, his family, his livestock, his home, his reputation, his future, all for these items, these three items. Imagine how pitiful that pile of what he'd coveted must now have looked when compared to everything that was, be, was to be gathered together and what he would lose. He couldn't even benefit from what he'd taken. He'd had to bury and hide the articles because he knew it was wrong. And my mind uh, drifted actually to Judas Iscariot and his 30 pieces of silver. And when he was seized with remorse at what he'd lost, he throws away what had become to him worthless coins as he's faced with what he's done and he, he hangs himself. You know, sin can be extremely tempting. It's a very clever illusion at times, full of false promises, deceitful. But when it's revealed for what it is, when it's brought into the light, it appears so pitiful. The exchange that we make is so imbalanced. I was thinking a little bit about the um, one of my favourite films from childhood, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, and the scene with the child catcher. I don't know if you've if you've seen that, but there's this man that's trying to lure two young children into his trap, and he decorates his carriage with all sorts of attractive features, and he promises the children biscuits and ice cream if they just come into his carriage and they duly enter in and submit to the temptation. And as soon as they do so, he slams the door shut and all the, um, the decoration falls away from the carriage and it's shown to be a cage in which they're now trapped. Suddenly, all the attractiveness falls away and the reality of what they've fallen for becomes evident. We know that not, that not all misfortune is a result of sin by any means. Scripture makes that patently clear. But that shouldn't deflect us from remembering that on occasion, sin is at the heart of some of the problems that we face, both as individuals and potentially as a church community. So we must constantly be vigilant about rooting out sin, which causes consequences, separation from God and break, breaks in other relationships. Let's be vigilant about keeping an eye on the risk of sin taking root in our lives, either individually or collectively. But one or two words about what seems a harsh punishment for Achan. I mean, first, it's important to note that this was a direct disobedience of God's specific command of the covenant between God and his people. It was relating to what was to be devoted to him, to God. So it was not only a human flaw or a transient slip, but a deliberate theft from God himself. And that was a serious business for the nation of Israel. And second, as a nation, for Israel, the sin of an individual was the sin of that nation. And the consequences were therefore suffered by the whole nation. We read in verse 12, 
God says, I will not be with you anymore. Verse 13, you cannot stand against your enemies until you remove it. And Joshua says in verse 25 to Achan, why have you brought this trouble on us? So these were weighty matters. And we read that Achan faces his demise in a place that's now called the Valley of Achor, meaning the Valley of Trouble. And it's interesting that there are two other mentions of this valley in the Old Testament. In the book of Hosea, the prophet speaks of making the Valley of Trouble a door of hope. Making the Valley of Trouble a door of hope, Hosea 2 verses 14 to 16. And Isaiah 65 verse 10, we read the Valley of Trouble becomes a resting place for herds and people who seek me. That's what God says. So there's this sense in which this valley of trouble becomes a place of hope, a way through to hope. And that reminds us that as Christians, we have this door of hope, of transformation. Jesus transforms trouble into hope. However dark, he keeps the door open to us, offers us a fresh start. Jesus can always turn things around, no matter where we find ourselves, as long as we turn to him. And that reminded me, I suppose, of another man who took material possessions and ran into trouble, and that was the prodigal son. He wanted his share of his father, of his inheritance from his father, in order to be able to enjoy the things of the world, the temptations that he faced. And he ended up alone, very far from home, competing for food with the pigs that he was living with. He was in a dark place, but he turned and went back to his father. And the response he got was warm, loving, generous and forgiving. And that's a message for us as Christians, again, that no matter where our sin takes us, there is always a way back to Jesus. We can be thankful for the salvation that we have, for the forgiveness and the new life that we can begin in that relationship that's restored with God through the saving grace of Jesus Christ. So as we look at this story from Joshua 7, the, the, the hardship and the conviction of Achan, let's remember also that that valley of trouble can also be a door of hope and one that we can walk through. Let's just spend a moment in prayer before we close with a song. Father, we thank you for the hope that we find in the gospel. We thank you for the hope in Jesus, in that restored relationship. And I ask that as we dwell on this story today, we can take that hope with us into our lives and live a life of hope in relationship with Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us and we're going to close now with a song that picks up this theme of hope. Some hope in chariots, some hope in wealth. My hope is 
is Jesus and nothing else. Oh, such love, such love and grace leads me to seek my Savior's face. Some hope in armies and the strength of man. My hope is Jesus, who calls me friend. He bears me up if I should fall. My everything, my all in all. What love is this that knows no The Son of God, through whom I live. Some hope in fortune, some hope in fame. My hope is Jesus, salvation's name. For there he hung and bore my that I might live and bear his name. What love is this? The Savior's blood, my righteousness, his wounds to make me whole. He said, Sacrifice to save my soul. What love is this that knows no pride or selfishness? Poured out upon Love's work is done, and I am free. My hope is Jesus. My hope is Jesus.